everyone. This is The Money Show with Harry Brown. I'm John Chandler, Harry's co-host on The Money Show. Welcome this afternoon, this beautiful Sunday afternoon on November the 13th, 2005. We're very, very happy to have you join us this afternoon. Uh, Harry, are you here, and uh, how are you doing today? I'm just fine. I'm in Nashville, and I hope the weather is as nice all around the country as it is here. I'm not sure what the temperature is today, but uh, last night at about midnight, it was 63 outside and uh, very, very pleasant. So I hope it's a, a nice sunny day wherever you are in this great land of ours. And we're here to talk about money today, your savings, your investments, anything that is on your mind. Uh, just give us a call, 1-800-259-9231, and raise any question you want. This show is sponsored in part by the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds, who are happy to make John and myself available for anything that uh, you want to ask, anything you want to comment on. But uh, we'll start right off with a few things that have come up in the mailbag and uh, in the news lately. John, what's on the uh, agenda? Well, uh, before I get to that, I would, of course, like to invite any of the listeners to call in if you have a comment, criticism, question, need information. Uh, We'll be more than happy to try to answer the question, provide information. That number to call is 800-259-9231. So call 800-259-9231 anytime during the program, and we'll be happy to try to help you. Well, today it, it could be a very, very uh, profound uh, topic and program that we deal with. And it's a topic that I've been hearing uh, people discuss in one way or another over the last uh, two or three years. Uh, and no one seems to have an answer. Uh, aren't you glad you tuned in this afternoon? Because Harry and I will have the answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, now we, you're making me nervous. <laughs> uh, in any event, this is a, a potential uh, uh, problem that uh, I think uh, deserves some attention, and I think it deserves attention because uh, there are a growing number of very, very small group of people who are seriously concerned about this issue. And uh, it is an issue that I think needs to be brought out. And what we're talking about here today is an economic challenge, perhaps of true economic proportions to the United States. And what you may hear today from us on this program is a call to arms, futile as it may be, it would nevertheless perhaps will be a call to arms to see if we can uh, come up with some ideas, suggestions as to how to uh, cope with this uh, economic challenge. And the economic challenge can be put uh, according to the ways I've seen other people put it, and I'll put it all together this afternoon, in a few questions. And the questions are things like this. Is America resting on its economic laurels? Are we complacent because we've been the world's economic leader for so long? Do our government and we as our people have our heads in the sand? Do we not see, recognize what's going on on a global scale throughout the world? Is tilting, shifting, changing the world economic climate? Well, if the answer is yes to any of these things, The question is, where will it lead us if it continues? Will America's economic power decline, and will China achieve its goal of becoming the world's leading economic and thus military power over the next couple of decades? Well, if you visited Shanghai today, you might be worried. Shanghai is a city of 20 million people, and its number of new buildings make New York look like a quaint village. The transformation over the last 10 years in Shanghai is staggering to believe, and they have greater plans for the future. The national bird of China might be the construction crane. So we go into the question now, if that kind of thing is going on, is it really necessary for the current trend of economic problems we've seen in this country uh, to continue? Well, of course it's not necessary. 
But given the history of events, the political situation in this country over the last 50 years, there's really very little reason to believe it will con- it will change. But it can change, and it's difficult to predict. But many people think it must change if we are to continue with the economic prosperity we've known in the past. It's up to us and the people we elect. I'll pause here for uh, before I continue with uh, what this has to do with your investment and the economic uh, events that are related and how we'll go about looking at uh, the solution to these uh, economic problems. Uh, Bob, pause at this moment and give Harry a chance to chime in with anything he'd like to add or say at this point. Well, first of all, we need to realize <clears throat> that a case can be made for anything. And cases are made for just about anything in investment newsletters. Uh, one side is bullish, the other side is bearish, and each of them can have a compelling case to demonstrate why their side is logical, reasonable, correct, inevitable, whatever you want to say. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, uh, we, we need to start with that premise uh, but that doesn't mean we don't want to look into the future. Obviously, you know where John and I are going to wind up on this, as far as your investments are concerned. We think you need a balanced and diversified portfolio so that whichever side proves to be correct, you will be protected. Whether we wind up with continued prosperity or we go into an inflationary spiral or with the bottom falls out and we have deflation or we just go through a a typical mild recession, and then come back to another period of prosperity. Whatever it is, you need to be covered. And uh, while all of this is very interesting, and it's uh, and it may have a bearing on other parts of your life, such as your job or things of this sort, uh, so that you have an interest in exploring these topics, and I do not want to discourage anybody from exploring these topics. I think they're very important topics. But you also need to realize that this doesn't change anything with regard to protecting yourself from whatever may come. Now, with regard to these economic challenges, uh, let's take them one at a time and look at them. John, where do you want to start? Well, we have three uh, economic events that seem to be related. Uh, first, uh, a big topic of discussion over the last several years and a big area of concern for lots of people, particularly if it happened to you, is the loss of jobs and production capacity to other countries. Uh, another uh, topic and challenge is the trade deficit, which we're hearing more and more about and which hit another record high in September. And uh, related to those economic events that seem to have profound uh, interest in people is uh, government's continuing interference in the economic strength of America. And that strength is our nation's businesses. So first, let's talk about the general issue of outsourcing jobs and production. Uh, Here are just a couple of examples. In the 1960s, Boeing outsourced only about 2% of the manufacture of its planes to other countries. And when we come back after this coming break, we'll continue with the Boeing story, as well as the number of jobs that have been lost uh, in the last uh, five years. And we will see where that leads us. Meanwhile, we hope you'll stay tuned. And feel free to give us a call if you have any comments or questions. I'm John Chandler with Harry Brown on The Money Show. Please stay tuned. We've got more fun coming up. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio, one that will protect you whatever the future brings, prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression, and it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at LibertyFree.com, you can download the book for only $9.75. That's right, just nine seventy-five. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, here's the way to have your own bulletproof 
portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Fail Safe Investing, just go to libertyfree.com right now. That's libertyfree.com. back to The Money Show with Harry Brown. I'm John Chandler, and we're happy to have you here this afternoon, and we'll remind you that The Money Show is partially sponsored by the Permanent Portfolio Family of Fund, and also remind you that you're welcome to call 800-259-9231 if you have any comments or questions for Harry and I, or I, today, or any time, just send us an email uh, at harrybrown.org. And uh, we'll be happy to address uh, your questions and find the information that you're looking for. Uh, this afternoon, we have begun a discussion uh, on about three economic events that are uh, related and the economic events that we are talking about, the loss of jobs and production capacity to other country, uh, the trade deficit, and government's role in uh, making those situations better or worse. Uh, we begin talking about uh, the, the general issue of outsourcing jobs and production, and I'm again giving a couple of examples. Uh, in 1960s, uh, Boeing outsourced only about 2% of the manufacture of its planes to other countries. Uh, that number increased to about 30% in the 90s in the manufacture of their 777. Now it appears that they have plans to outsource about 70% of its new 787. Of course, we know there was recently a strike uh, at Boeing, crippling strike that prohibited, prohibited them from delivering any airplanes, and a very, very giant portion of this strike was a concern of their workers, about 70% of the uh, production capacity or capacity, uh, manufacturing capacity was going to be outsourced uh, to other countries. So that's a huge issue and uh, for Boeing people, but it's also an a issue because that same example can be given uh, throughout uh, the uh, industrial manufacturing business area of this entire country. Furthermore, uh, according to the Department of Labor Statistics, the United States has lost about 3 million manufacturing jobs. That's only manufacturing jobs since mid-2000. Well, why have we lost those jobs? Well, critics say it's a result of the Bush administration pushing uh, pushing uh, free trade agreements that reduce the cost of products for U.S. consumers but move production work overseas where the labor costs are lower. Now, some people argue that it doesn't matter that U.S. companies are moving more and more of their own plants overseas because the increased profits will go to the parent company and thus to the stockholders, who are mostly U.S. citizens. Besides, they ask, what can be wrong with the consumer paying a lower price? Well, uh, those are very good points, but uh, then then comes uh, the other side, as Harry would say. Uh, What about over the long term? How helpful will it be for... Western nations, and the United States in uh, particular, if some computer company lays off 14,000 people over the next year and hires 14,000 workers in China and India. So that is the first major uh, topic, uh, outsourcing of jobs in production. And now let's deal a little bit, Harry, with uh, what that says, what that means, uh, what the consequences are and what, if anything, uh, we as individual U.S. citizens should or could uh, do about it. Well, the first thing we need to realize is this is a complicated economic issue, and therefore it is ripe, absolutely ripe for political picking. This is something that politicians can land on, uh, pass new regulations for, pass new taxes for, and expect to get the uh, support of people in general around the United States because it's a hard issue to understand. It's an easy issue to distort and a very hard issue to uh, untangle. And I think uh, we have a responsibility here to untangle it. But first of all, let me start with a little anecdotal evidence of something. 
This past week, I had to call Microsoft support uh, because of uh, uh, a problem I had with front page, which is the um, uh, program, the computer program that I use to keep the website up. And I talked with someone in India, and I could not understand the person. The person spoke perfect English, but with an accent that required me to say, please say that again. What was that last part? Uh, are you saying this and so forth? The call took 40 minutes, and the last 40 seconds of it were the solution a solution that could have been given at the beginning of the, the entire conversation because none of what went before the 40 seconds led up to those 40 seconds in any way whatsoever. About two days later, someone from Microsoft called to check on my support uh, call. Could you understand the person? Uh, did you get the help you needed? You know, all these this questionnaire. And I told them, frankly, it was a, a terrible thing that I had to spend 40 minutes on the phone with this person trying to understand and so forth. Now, you can imagine that my experience was repeated many, many times over this past week and perhaps with people who would not just speak out and say, look, this is a terrible thing that you are, are uh, making me sit through uh, a conversation with somebody that I cannot decipher, uh, but a lot of people are going to do that, and this is going to have an effect on Microsoft in the marketplace. Now, not all of these jobs that are outsourced are jobs that are public relations jobs, in effect, which this one was, but this is just an example of the kinds of things that ha can happen. Are those people in India going to do the same job assembling computer parts that somebody in uh, Bellingham, Washington can do. Uh, the, the marketplace will take care of this, and if they do a good job at a lower price, as John pointed out, then this means that people in America are going to get lower prices on their computers and various other products that uh, have been outsourced. Now, here comes the complicated part. You've probably heard of the balance of payments. It is the overall payments that go back and forth between one country and another for products, for services, and for investments. Now, some people say we have a deficit in the overall balance of payments. We can't. It's impossible to have a deficit. It will always be in balance. Whatever part of that balance of payments is out of balance will be offset by another part that, pardon me, whatever part is in a deficit is going to be offset by another part that's in a surplus. And what has happened over the last 30 years uh, in America since the early 1970s is that we have been running a deficit in the balance of products and uh, somewhat sometimes in the overall balance of products and services, but this is offset by a surplus in the balance of investments. And why is that? Because when we buy a product from overseas, we pay for it in dollars here, and the overseas company winds up with dollars. Now, what do they do with those dollars? One of two things. They either sell them in the open market for their own currency, in which case somebody else has dollars, and the same problem exists there. What do they do with those dollars? They deposit them in an American bank, or they invest them in American stocks, or they buy American treasury bills. But whatever they do, uh, the, the money winds up in the United States, and let's see what happens with that money when we come back. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler. This is Harry Brown. Have you lost money in stocks over the past few years? From 2000 through 2002, the stock market lost a third of its value. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession, with no wide swings in value. My book, Failsafe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. Failsafe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. 
Go to libertyfree.com to see a sample chapter of Fail Safe Investing and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's libertyfree.com. You're listening to Money Talk with Harry Brown on the Genesis Communications Radio Network. Again, I'm John Chandler with Harry Brown. Uh, Harry, are you still awake? <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> well, we're not be awake with such an exciting subject. Uh, well, uh, this is the kind of subject that uh, makes some people's eyes glaze over, but it's also the kind of subject, uh, in combination of subjects, that are tremendously important uh, for our future, and they're very important because. It's the kind of thing that uh, our listeners and ourselves will be reading about, listening to, seeing on television every single day. If we listen closely, we'll hear something related to these subjects every day. And it's good to know uh, a little bit about what they mean and how to put it all into perspective and uh, whether to be concerned or not, and if so, uh, what can we do about it? Well, uh, uh, you just made a prediction that people are going to hear about it. And at the, when we conclude this subject, I'll make a prediction too. Uh, let's, let's continue with where we were. The money is uh, that you spend on overseas products, which go into the check, you know, that help to pay the, the uh, uh, workers in India and Thailand and these other places. Uh, that, mo- that money is in dollars when it leaves this country. And as I said before, either the people who receive it will trade it for their own currency, in which case somebody else will have dollars that will have to be dealt with. But one way or another, somebody overseas is going to have dollars, and he can't spend the dollars in China or in Thailand or these other places easily, uh, although some people are involved in international trade and can do so. But one way or another, those dollars will wind up in America. In fact, they never leave America. What happens is that a bank account in America transfers a certain amount of money from one owner to another, but the, the money, the dollars, remain in America. Now, what happens to those dollars? Those dollars have to be used in some way or other. Either they will sit in a bank account drawing interest, or they will be invested in the stock market, or they will be invested in uh, possibly corporate bonds, but more likely U.S. Treasury bonds. Uh, so we have three possibilities there. If the money is left in the bank to draw interest, then the bank is going to lend it out to some corporation uh, at the prime rate or the prime rate plus two or whatever it may be, and that corporation is going to use it to expand its products and services and to hire more people in the United States. Maybe hire more people overseas, but that just keeps the the cycle going. But sooner or later, it's going to have to be spent in the United States for uh, expansion purposes here, which means more jobs will be created here. If it's invested in the stock market, uh, if the, the dollars are invested in the stock market, you have the same situation there that a company will uh, be able to expand its products or services where it wasn't able to do so otherwise. Because every dollar that's invested in an existing company, uh, an existing stock, uh, paves the way for new stocks to be offered, uh, what they call IPOs, initial public offerings, which are always going to go into the development of new companies and new products and services, which means new jobs. And finally, the third way is if it's invested in treasury bonds, that's the non-productive way because all that does is to help to cover the federal deficit. And we all know what we think of federal deficits. Boo. So uh, of the three possibilities, two of them are very good for uh, jobs in America. And the problem is that we can see the jobs that just are outsourced and go overseas, but we can't see the jobs that are created in America as a result of this cycle of dollars going uh, from one owner to another. And uh, so what I'm trying to say here is that the problem is not nearly as bad as it seems, but because the, the bad, so-called bad side of it is perfectly visible, and the good side of it is roughly really 
pretty much in, invisible, then what you're going to get, and here is the prediction, is a lot of politicians capitalizing on this by passing laws that say, uh, if you put your jobs overseas, then your tax rate is going to be this, or you have to pay this, or you have to do that, or whatever it is. And it is going to interfere with the natural processes of the market. The jobs are going overseas because the politicians have made the jobs inhabitable over in America. Uh, with so many regulations, with so many taxes, with so many problems, it is easier to hire people in India or Thailand than to hire them here. Eventually, they will have to hire them here uh, to use those dollars that are keep coming back here. But uh, in the meantime, those jobs are going overseas as a natural reaction to what the politicians have done. And what always happens is that the politicians then move in capitalize on what they have done to companies and say these companies are not playing fair, they're using foreign workers, therefore we are going to have another political program to solve the, the problems created by the political program we passed last year or three years ago or ten years ago, whatever it is. And so the prediction, of course, is that the politicians will capitalize on it and make it worse, but uh, they will not stop the natural processes of the market they will just make them more expensive, and we will not get the benefit of those cheaper uh, products that we thought we were going to get because of foreign labor. I hope I'm making this clear because it is a very important subject to understand. Uh, and the final uh, result of it all is that I think you can turn away from it and just let the market uh, do its, uh, its job and not worry to death about the outsourcing of jobs because it all evens out in the end. Okay, uh, I would like to add about uh, two or three points to what sure. Harry has said. First point is uh, the reason it's difficult to uh, accept the balance that, that Harry suggests is that it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, there is a considerable delay in cause effect. Very true. And that delay comes uh, intermittently over a long period of time. It doesn't just happen uh, overnight, like black, white, turn the switch off, turn the switch on. It's it's very gradual, and it's difficult to see and difficult to w watch it uh, build up. A uh, second point I would like to make is, is that, that the worry warts, uh, and I'm one of them sometimes, uh, they say, uh, well, sure, Harry, but uh, for the better part of the uh, last century, uh, the United States had a uh, trade surplus. Mm -hmm. uh, and in addition to us having a trade surplus, the trade was in dollars. So not only were we uh, uh, producing and selling more to other countries than, than we were buying for them, uh, but they were uh, buying our goods in dollars. So we win two ways. We had the uh, employment, uh, production, uh, manufacturing capacity uh, that was uh, supplying the world more than the world was supplying to us. So we were able to make uh, profit and have uh, growth in industry and so forth. But in addition to that, uh, the trade was in dollars. Uh, so uh, when we come back, we may deal with that and then uh, move toward uh, why this is beginning to sound like a uh, Saturday night, but why you cannot draw a line between politics and money. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be back uh, in just a few minutes to finish this discussion and wrap it up with the solution. Meanwhile, we hope you're having an enjoyable afternoon. We'll be back soon. Stay tuned. Again, this is John Chandler with Harry Brown on The Money Show. Beautiful Sunday afternoon, at least in Tennessee and in Central Texas. We're glad to have you back. Uh, let's continue on with our discussion. We were uh, discussing and uh, just about finished up the discussion on uh, outsourcing of jobs. And as the program ended, I uh, noted this this program may be 
uh, beginning to sound like uh, Harry's political show on Saturday night. Uh, and it is, to some degree, a political issue, but it's very, very important to recognize that uh, it's impossible that I know of to draw the line between political consequences and economic or money consequences. Uh, Harry, do you believe the line can be drawn? Or it seems to me that uh, a very, very strong uh, percentage of all political questions are really nothing more uh, than money questions that the politicians use as an excuse to, uh, as you mentioned, pass laws and to uh, grandstand uh, to find uh, to present to their voters that they have done something about uh, one problem or another. But I find it difficult to draw the line between uh, politics and economics. Uh, how about you? Well, uh, it, it is impossible because uh, what the politicians do affects what companies do. It affects the price of gold. It affects the price of silver. It affects the price of other commodities. And uh, so if we're going to speculate in any way whatsoever, then politics must be taken into consideration. And we've mentioned uh, Richard Mayberry on this show from time to time. He has a very interesting newsletter called Early Warning Report. And his whole approach to this is what are the politicians doing and what is this going to create with regard to which companies will be likely to profit from what the politicians are doing and which ones are likely to be hurt as a result of it. And I just cite that as an example of the way that politics is taken into consideration when making specific investment decisions, in Richard Mayberry's case, to speculate on certain stocks that should profit from the political consequences. Now, in uh, in this way, uh, it's important for speculating. Uh, uh, once again, I have to say, though, that for investing, for the money that you cannot afford to lose, you should not be swayed by what somebody says is likely to happen in the future because of politics or anything else, because we do live in an uncertain world, and it is all speculation when we try to look into the future and say, this is going to be good for this company and this is going to be bad for another one. Well, let's take a quick look. You've already touched on this, uh, but it's a topic come up, that comes up with, not just in uh, outsourcing a job to production, but you mentioned the trade deficit. And you see headlines, hear things about uh, the trade deficit. For example, a report just came out uh, that in September the trade de deficit ballooned to a new record. Mm -hmm. uh, the Commerce Department said the deficit was a record $66.1 million. That's 11.4% more than the month before. Well, first of all, every time you are in an upward trend, it means that every month you have a new record. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I can remember the the horror uh, when the trade uh, balance went from a surplus to a deficit. I must have gotten five calls that day that the uh, Commerce Department announced the figures. Oh, my God, this is the first trade deficit the U.S. has had in X number of years. I don't know what it was, maybe 800 years or something. Anyway, um, uh, and ever since then, you know, the trade deficit has been going up, and you probably had in all that time about uh, 10 months uh, when it went down slightly and then went back up the next month. So, first of all, we have to recognize that the fact that it's a, a new record is uh, not anything to get terribly excited about. And uh, the, the height of the figure uh, can be measured in a per, as a percentage of the GDP or a percentage of uh, the overall balance of payments or whatever you want to, to measure it uh, by. But the fact of the matter is that this is what it is, and uh, it's nothing to, to be excited about. It just happens. And uh, uh, as I said before, it will all balance out in the end. Uh, but it will balance out going through a torturous process because of what the politicians will do to try to cure this trade deficit. And uh, all they are doing is just getting in your way of buying the products and services you want. The first rule of international trade should be that you can buy whatever you want from whomever you want to buy it uh, and, and do what you want to do, whether you want to buy Italian shoes or uh, silk from India, 
if that's where they produce the silk or rice from Japan or computers that are assembled in India, whatever it is, you should be able to buy what you want. That's the only free trade you need. You do not need free trade agreements. You do not need uh, to say, well, uh, this product uh, should have a tariff of this and this product should have no tariff at all or anything. That's not free trade. That's managed trade. And managed trade is political trade. And political trade means that it will be arranged to suit those who have the most political influence. And that will never be you or me. And so what we want is the freedom to buy what we want wherever we want to buy it, whenever we want to buy it. And that's not what George Bush or the Democrats have in mind. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes to uh, wrap up today's show. And uh, you might send us some questions this week. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio, one that will protect you whatever the future brings, prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression, and it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at libertyfree.com, you can download the book for only $9.75. That's right, just nine seventy five. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, here's the way to have your own bulletproof portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Fail Safe Investing, just go to libertyfree.com right now. That's libertyfree.com. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Well, we've uh, created, uh, discussed some uh, major topics of concern to a lot of people, and the question now comes to what's the solution? Well, uh, if there is one, the solution, in my judgment, lies in the hands of the entrepreneur, in the hands of American business. But business must have incentives to solve the problem and be unshackled from the restraints of high taxes, government regulation. It must be free to compete and find ways to profit and provide jobs and prosperity to the people of this country. Tide must turn if we are to continue to prosper. Indeed, business better wake up and stop supporting its potential demise by not recognizing the problem with big government and the big government interfering with its affairs and business and the well-being of their business and the people of this country and stop supporting big government. Harry, uh, I'll let you uh, take it from there because I know uh, you're better at it than me. Well, a lot of uh, companies and uh, company executives believe that since we have this climate where government is so deeply involved, then the best thing to do is to go with the flow and try to use government to its own advantage. And they very often think that they can do that through the Republican Party more easily through the Democratic Party. But, of course, what they're doing is digging their own graves as they think that they're getting some kind of special privilege from the government or, or subsidy. Because once they get in bed with the government, then they find that the government is going to choose what sheets are going to be on the bed, what kind of pillow, uh, the whole works. And... Uh, Partnership between big government and big business means big government runs the roost and tells big business what to do. And in fact, uh, somebody has pointed out the, the a partnership between big government and big business is the strict economic definition of fascism. Fascism is not tyranny. Uh, fascism is an economic system that leads to tyranny because it's a system in which uh, private property remains intact, but government tells the owner of the property how he can use it, meaning a company, what it can produce, uh, who it must hire, and all of these decisions uh, become subject to government approval. And that's the strict definition of fascism, whereas communism is where the government owns everything, and socialism is where government owns the means of production, and other products and services are produced by uh, uh, in 
individuals in in business. In other words, I should say government owns the, the major utilities like electricity and social security and all these things. So what we have in America is a combination of socialism and fascism today. But to get back to what John said, business has to wake up and realize that its salvation does not lie in a partnership with government. What it must do is to oppose it. But we're in the hands of a two-party system that has legislated itself into existence by law. Uh, we have a two-party system not because this is what America is asking for, but because this is what the politicians have uh, legislated and made it almost impossible for a third party to, to succeed in America. So the, the situation is not optimistic, but it is hopeful. I think that we can overcome this in the long run, but it's going to take a lot of changes of mind of a lot of important people in this country, and we might talk about this. Send us questions during the week uh, about this subject, and we'll try to wrap it up next week with answers to your questions. For John Chandler, this is Harry Brown, and for the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds, this is also Harry Brown. We'll see you next week. 